When I was a child, I loved Harry Potter. I used to read all of the books as soon as they came out and then reread them. I watched every film in theaters. It was the first fandom I ever let myself get engrossed in. I'm pretty sure the first fan fiction I ever read involved Harry Potter meeting Justin Timberlake. They kissed at the end of the story. It was very scandalous. I loved Harry Potter. I loved the characters. I loved the inventive plots. But most of all, I loved the world. The world of Harry Potter felt so inventive, so special, so unlike anything I'd seen before. I wanted more than anything to live inside of it, to explore and find out what that world had to show me. It felt like pure imagination. After the last film came out, I sort of put the world of Harry Potter out of my mind. It wasn't intentional, mostly just a case of growing up and moving on to other things. Occasionally I'd click on BuzzFeed articles about Pottermore or whatever the cast looks like now. I'd reminisce with friends or talk about maybe someday visiting the theme park if I ever had the time or money or inclination. Maybe I'd stop on the movies if they were playing on TV, and I'm about 80% certain that I saw the first Fantastic Beast movie in theaters, but I wasn't really focusing on it. Then the new Fantastic Beast movie came out, and for the first time in a while, my interest was Pete. Because people hate this movie. This is for a lot of reasons. Bad plotting, paper-thin characters, for diminishing how they feel about J.K. Rowling as an author. But I was fascinated, because in this film, Rowling walks into one of the most basic traps in urban fantasy, and in doing so, reveals a lot about her own world. She manages to show, somehow, that the world of Harry Potter is unbelievably lacking in imagination. And since one of the websites where I got into endless discussions about this world is about to die, I thought I'd make a brief departure from my usual content and go into an old-fashioned fandom rant, for old time's sake. Let's dig into the world of Harry Potter and the ideology it sits on top of. Before we get started, a few things. One, I know this series has been discussed to death. But it's precisely because it's so popular that it's worth looking at. Millions of people have read this series, and clearly it's had a huge impact on a lot of them. Not just culturally, but politically. Secondly, I'm also not saying you're a bad person if you like Harry Potter. I myself like the series. But it's important to look at what you're consuming critically, and consider what messages it's giving you. Finally, I am not saying that J.K. Rowling is a bad, irredeemable person. I don't think she intentionally set out to create works of centrist political propaganda to make everyone fall in love with Tony Blair or something. It's not intentional, just someone regurgitating the things they themselves have learned. And again, that's why it's worth looking at critically. Also, spoilers, etc, etc. I mentioned in the intro that Rowling fell into one of urban fantasy's most basic traps. Urban fantasy, sometimes called modern fantasy, is a genre that combines fantasy conventions and tropes with a modern setting. It's sexy teen wolves in modern California instead of hobbits in a completely made-up Middle Earth. There are debates about whether Harry Potter counts as urban fantasy, given that much of it takes place in a world that is separated off, but the world we know, the Muggle world, is still there. London, with all of its modern buildings and underground and unnecessarily complex social events, is still right there, next door. Harry Potter's world shares a history with ours, except in Harry Potter, there's magic in that history. And therein lies the problem. If there was magic in the world, then either the whole of history would have been entirely different, or those who wield magic made some interesting choices at some point. This often leads to some unfortunate implications. For example, say a girl was born in the early 1600s in the Wampanoag tribe in Massachusetts. She's a muggle-born. When the pilgrims arrive, she's coming into her powers. At first, they all seem friendly and everyone is fine, but then people start to die. She uses her newfound powers to protect her people. And then suddenly a British man, who looks just like the pilgrims she's been fighting comes to her and tells her that she's a witch, and he'll take her off to a magical school to get trained with a bunch of other people, thousands of miles away, leaving her family to fend for themselves. What do you think she'll do? 
go with this mysterious man who, again, looks just like the people who've been hurting her family, or try to fight this man off. And if this man, in response, fights, or makes her go to the school against her will, or even hurts her if things get heated, what does that make him? What does that make the magical society that allows this? Again, this is just one example. You can go down rabbit holes for hours with this kind of thinking in Rowling's world. Were there any Russian wizards in 1917 who would read with the Soviet cause and wanted to spread magic among the masses? How were so many regions of the world colonized by European Muggle armies if there were presumably wizards in their societies? And you might say something like, oh, witches and wizards are a separate society that sticks to their own and doesn't concern themselves with Muggle affairs, but like, how did they get that way? The wizarding world features a lot of very similar governments and trains wizards in very similar schools, but at some point in history, this must not have been true. How on earth did this world come to be? How would people come to ignore their own societies and tribes and families unless they were made to? How could every witch and wizard in history ignore the suffering their muggled counterparts were going through? How could every war and atrocity still happen if there was literal magic? So, so yeah, this thinking takes you round and round in circles. There are a few different ways to deal with this problem effectively. One is to confront the unfortunate implications of your world head-on. A good example of this is Black Panther from earlier this year. The problem with Black Panther's Wakanda is that if a powerful nation full of super advanced technology that was never colonized by European powers existed on the African continent, but everything else about history remained pretty much the same, it means that Wakanda at some point decided to ignore the suffering of neighboring countries, which could make it a bit hard to celebrate these characters and this world. But the film confronts this problem directly. This problem drives the entire plot of the film. From the very start of the film, Nakia tells our protagonist and the audience that the state of affairs is wrong. The villain is someone who has been immensely hurt by this policy of separation, and confronts Takala with what Wakanda ignores. And our protagonist realizes that they've made a horrible mistake, that his father and predecessors were wrong. All of you are wrong! To turn your backs on the rest of the world! And he must open things up and try to help everyone. We must find a way to look after one another as if we were one single tribe. On the question of reform versus revolution, Black Panther does come down a little too heavy on the reform side for my taste, but it's a mid-budget Disney release. You, you can't have everything. The other way to deal with the problem of unfortunate implications is to ignore it. To say, that speculation about history is really interesting, but it's not the story we're telling. This is the route that the original Harry Potter films and movies go with. And to be honest, this works fine too. The original Harry Potter takes place in the 90s, which was a fairly stable period of time in the Western world. There were, on the surface at least, not too many issues in Muggle London for wizards to solve. It makes a fine, calm backdrop for a dramatic wizard conflict. The only people who will tie themselves up in knots over history are pedantic internet nerds, of which I am proud to be one. But everyone else will correctly roll their eyes at these nerds and enjoy the fun. The tactic of ignoring historical implication works really well unless you force people to confront it directly. And yes, I know I just said that confronting your audience with this information was good. But there is a big difference in building your entire first movie highlighting this specific part of your world around these issues and just suddenly dropping these historical issues in after ignoring them for ten full movies and seven books of a highly established world and into a prequel series, no less, so a world that is mostly locked into place. It forces the audience out of the fantasy, out of the careful world you've built over many, many books and movies. It could seem careless to, I don't know, choose to bring up one of the most horrifying events of the 20th century in the middle of your story about magic. Which is, of course, why J.K. Rowling, in Fantastic Beasts 2, has her villain get up on a big stage in the 1920s and state that he's going to save the world from future muggle atrocities like nuclear war and the Holocaust. Yes, one of Grindelwald's main goals is apparently stopping the Holocaust. 
which is just legitimately insane of her to bring up. Yes, Grindelwald has ulterior motives. He wants to prove that muggles are incapable of running the world, and he's using this as justification for supreme wizard rule. But bringing it up makes it clear that wizards, good guy wizards like Dumbledore and cute little Newt Scamander, could have done something maybe to stop the Holocaust, could have saved millions of lives. But they didn't. Why the hell would you even bring this up? It's worth taking a step back here and looking at both the world in which Harry Potter was written and the ideology that undergirds it. As I mentioned before, Harry Potter was written in the 1990s. This decade was marked by the sense that because the Cold War was over, the ideas of the West had won out. The main question of the 20th century, is communism or capitalism the best way to organize society, had come down firmly on the side of capitalism, and now we just had to tinker with the details and make that capitalism as good as possible. In 1992, just five years before Harry Potter was first published, political scientist Francis Fukuyama wrote a book called The End of History and the Last Man. What we may be witnessing is not just the end of the Cold War, or the passing of a particular period of post-war history, but the end of history as such, that is, the end point of mankind's ideological evolution and the universalization of Western liberal democracy as the final form of human government. The prevailing political theory of the time held that the Western status quo, that is, a liberal democracy that leaned heavily on markets, was the best form of government and should be spread around the world. Even many people who called themselves left-wing during this period were not talking much about labor joining together or seizing property from capital, as Marx had discussed. Those ideas had supposedly been thoroughly debunked as a way to organize society or build power. Now, the right way for regular people to gain power was to work hard, prove your skills or ideas were worthy, and get into the right school, or build a better mousetrap, or write a book that sells more than any other book in history since the Bible. This idea, that traits like intelligence push people up into good positions in the market or in government, is generally called meritocracy. You succeed based on your merit. This whole set of ideas about liberal democracy and meritocracy in the market have often generally been tied together and called neoliberalism. This word has been thrown around quite a bit lately and irritates a lot of people, including J.K. Rowling herself. But this didn't just start when J.K. Rowling started arguing with people about politics on Twitter. Noticing neoliberalism in Harry Potter has been going on for a while. Way back in the ancient time of 2004, there was an article called Harry Potter Market Wiz, which shows that for all of the magic, the underlying structure of the Harry Potter universe is strikingly similar to our own muggle world. On the face of it, the world of Harry Potter has nothing in common with our own. Nothing at all. Except one detail. Like ours, the fantastic universe of Harry Potter is a capitalist universe. The apprentice sorcerers are also consumers who dream of acquiring all sorts of high-tech magical objects, like high-performance wands or the latest brand-name flying brooms, manufactured by multinational corporations. Hogwarts, then, is not only a school, but also a market. Subject to an incessant advertising onslaught, the students are never as happy as when they can spend their money in the boutiques near the school. It does seem odd that in a world where you can duplicate or endlessly expand objects, that most people are still constantly plagued by advertising, or obsessed with buying products, all of which are conveniently available at the Wizarding World of Harry Potter and Universal. There was also a piece called Harry Potter and the Third Way from the even more ancient time of 2001. It compares the series to Britain's then Prime Minister Tony Blair's ideal, the technocracy. A technocracy is a society led by elite technical experts, which sounds great, until you realize that it cuts a whole class of people who were not able to afford fancy schools or network with the right kind of person right out of the process. The article argues that the Wizarding World is a perfect Blairite technocracy, governed by a techno-managerial elite. This might seem like a bit of a stretch, but when you think about it, pretty much every adult making choices in the series is part of the professional class. Is a professor at an elite school, or a member of the government, or a wizarding spy? Even the Weasleys, who are comparatively poor. How is poverty even a thing when you can magic yourself whatever you want? Anyway, they have in their family two government officials, a banker, 
a expert at a dragon preserve, and two entrepreneurial startup types. They are all pretty much petite bourgeoisie or above. It's not like Harry Potter goes and has adventures with the janitor Filch. The one exception to this could be Hogrid, but he knows all of the right people. When you start to look at it, the structure of Harry Potter's world is incredibly similar to our modern world. There are banks and money and markets. The government is a ministry like any other British ministry. National borders seem to exist in pretty much the same way. And most people either go into education, government, or free enterprise upon graduating from school. For a bunch of people who can bend the universe to their will, these wizards have enormous faith in Western institutions. The wizarding world is also a classic meritocracy. All of those people who take quizzes to find out their Hogwarts house or talk about who they would be in the wizarding world are kind of wrong, because in all likelihood, in the world of the Harry Potter universe, they'd still be a muggle, living the exact same life they're living now. Not that I blame fans for doing this, saying you'd be in the exact same position in life is not really much of a fantasy at all, or any fun, but not any muggle can learn about magic or attend Hogwarts. It's the special people with special inherent skills who get to learn and rise up. And once they're there in the prestigious magic school, oh, some people might have come from old families, but you're all judged fairly on the same material. The best skills win out. Now, it's not just that the Wizarding World structure is similar to our own. It'd be one thing if Rowling was making a satirical point. And to be fair, she does do a little of this. As the 90s turned into the 2000s, Rowling was clearly interested in using her platform to critique the political climate. Hey, the US magical government has a threat level, 80 full years before 9-11. What was the wizarding 9-11 that led them to build this threat level? But the books seem to suggest that the status quo of the wizarding world is the way things should be. Yes, there are some bad government employees and bad ministers of magic, but the wizarding world is saved by trusting an authority figure, in this case the headmaster of an elite school. And that idyllic epilogue where Harry and his friends stand on platform nine and three quarters and send their own children off to school, they've all joined the government and made changes from within the system. To Rowling, this is the ideal world. To prevent another Voldemort, all we need is for good people to be in the right offices in our existing structure. There is nothing inherently inequitable within it. Wizards and muggles need to remain separate, even though it leads to suffering, because that's just the way it is. Our lives should be dominated by the merciless market forces, because that's just the way it is. Truly, the wizarding world is good, just as capitalist democracy is good. Both are the best of all possible worlds. But of course this isn't true. In our world, meritocracy is a lie. There are structural systems of oppression in place that give people unequal chances. The markets that govern our world reward unjust behavior and keep both lower classes and entire nations down. Putting different people in office doesn't address these structural inequities that already exist. And Fujiyama has several times tried to go back on his end of history statement when history kept, you know, happening. Similarly, the structure of the wizarding world is also unjust. Just because magic is real in that world doesn't mean it's real to most people. People still die because they don't have health insurance or food or in horrible atrocities that maybe could be prevented. And you might be saying, oh, wizards are not supposed to interfere in muggle affairs. Here's a quote from the first book where Hagrid says that. Well, I'm sorry, Hagrid, but that's a bad answer. Let's swap out a few words here and bring this into the muggle world. Now, if you were hungry, if your family was hungry, would you accept this answer? That, sorry, we can't help you because then you'll want more of this resource we're hoarding. Can't have that. We all live on this planet together. We all have to help each other. The more you look at it, the more the wizarding world looks like an insane separatist nightmare cooked up by Ayn Rand. I am John Gold. Were wizards afraid for the planet during the Cuban Missile Crisis? Do they plan to let entire cities drown and the planet to die while they keep up the masquerade? Did they allow the Holocaust to happen? Or is this all just not their problem? It is very notable to me that there is a far right-wing faction in the Harry Potter universe, one that calls for the supremacy of wizard kind and the genocide of all muggles. 
And there is also a center, which states that the status quo of the wizarding world is good, that the system as is is good, and that wizards and muggles should be kept separate. But where is the left? A left that would state, hypothetically, that wizards and muggles should come together and share their resources with each other, build a better world together. Do you remember seeing this position anywhere in the original films or books? But the only people who sort of advocate for that position in the entire canon are Jacob and Tweeney from the new movies, and they're kind of more about their messed up, not always entirely consensual relationship than the issues of the wider world. Also, Tweeney joins the right-wing fascists in a bizarre bid to stay with Jacob, so her politics are just all over the map. There isn't a real left in Harry Potter, which made some sense. Rowling came up during a time when the question of communism was settled, where the Western status quo was considered to be the pinnacle of achievement, where the world was just getting better and better all the time. Uh, you know when you work for Enron, you're going to see the newest thinking, you're going to see the newest products, the newest uh, services, you're going to see the newest markets opening up, the newest ways of thinking about things. Anyone who was too far left, anyone who thought that Marx might have had a few good points, was labeled a weirdo, or a whiner, or someone who just can't be happy with what they have. Again, this isn't true, but by the time the failure of Tony Blair's new labor market-based thinking became obvious, Rowling was, a uh, insulated from the consequences. To her, and many like her, the 90s represent the best we can do. You're building a brighter future for all of us. For a free guide that can help you on the path to home ownership, call the Fannie Mae Foundation. They believe that too much upheaval is inherently bad, that more than anything, we should be trying to get things back to normal. They are horrified by Trump, but somehow see Jeremy Corbyn as the exact same thing. Which seems odd. They are, after all, ideological opposites. But they both represent upheaval from the norm. And the norm is, according to centrist thought, what we should strive for. Scotland should stay with the UK because that's the norm. The situation between Israel and Palestine is tragic, but boycotts against Israel break the norm. A truly left-wing labor movement breaks the norm. We are at the end of history. The ideal of the 90s is all we can hope for or imagine. <laughs> The problems with this line of thought become more pronounced when you take the Wizarding World out of the 90s and bring it back in time to a world before the end of history. Rowling talks about how excited she is to write about a larger world in different locations, but honestly, it strikes me how things in the Wizarding World don't look that different in the Fantastic Beasts films. Hogwarts looks exactly the same as it will 70 years in the future. The Wizarding World status quo is frozen in time. But of course, when Rowling is dealing with actual history, she doesn't have the luxury of this 90s norm to fall back on. Thus, she has her villain get on the stage and announce to the Wizarding World that he will prevent horrible events in the future. Now again, I know he is doing this to manipulate his audience. But what will Newt, our adorable protagonist's response be? It could be horrible things do happen in the world but we should use our gifts to improve all of humanity. We could help muggles with magic. They could use technology to help us. Let's tear down the ministry and build a better world together. But I'd be surprised if the films take this route. For one, Newt is clearly not a fan of taking sides. And for two, as I said before, the wizarding world looks exactly the same as it does 70 years in the future. In the future, magic is still separate. Wizards still see models as barely worth interacting with. Gotta love Hogwarts. Yeah, it's exactly the same. Nothing's changed. No, still floating candles. So why does Rowling even mention the Second World War if none of her heroes intend to stop it? Well, I'd argue that for her, history is not something that lives and breathes, something full of lessons and alternate possibilities, something that can tell us how the modern world was built. History in this story is just window dressing, for an exciting tale about Dumbledore finding a necklace. Honestly, 
Maybe she doesn't really see the rise of the Nazis as something preventable, as something that wizards or ordinary people could build a movement to stop. She sees it as a frozen event, as a chapter in a dusty old history book, unchangeable even in fiction. After all, if you kill baby Hitler, it'll mess with the timeline. Whatever happened happened, and it was all terribly sad, but it's in the past on the way to our normal status quo. It doesn't occur to her that this rising fascist movement is maybe something her characters could stop, just as it doesn't occur to her now that passionate anti-fascist action could prevent a modern fascist movement. After all, things could get bad, but we can beat the fascists in the marketplace of ideas, get reasonable centrists in office, and everything will go back to normal. Or maybe she just doesn't want to look too closely at what could have prevented the rise of the Nazis, but she'll still realize that those reasonable centrist ideas didn't work. I am perhaps being too harsh on her, but importing real history into a fictional world should come with some harsh questions. It is important to look at history for lessons, it is important to look at how our world was formed. After all, unlike the wizarding world, our norms and governments didn't just spring into being from nothing, and they are not frozen in some 90s centrist ideal. The world changes and can be changed for the better. Why does any of this matter? It is, after all, just a kid's book. Well, it's a kid's book that has reached millions of people. It reached them in childhood and showed them a world of magic and possibility. But the underlying structure of the world was pretty much the same as our own. It's a world of endless possibility, and yet people are still poor. People are still constantly shopping. People are still terrified they'll end up in thankless desk jobs. What Mr. Scamander fears above everything else is having to work in an office. It can limit your scope of what's possible you can give people the idea that the big things never change. When thinking about Harry Potter, I always come back to the epilogue. It's supposed to be a beautiful, calm scene, but I've always read it as somewhat creepy. Because nothing has truly changed. All the same conditions are still there. The Wizarding World is doomed to live out the same story over and over again. Capitalism gives us the same circle, and this is the loop from which we must escape, and we can. After all, the wizarding world might not have a left, but the real one does. We can imagine a different world, one not defined by the same market forces and owned by the same rich families. In order to not fall into the same traps, we must imagine a radically different future. So, uh, thank you guys for watching this. I, uh, this was originally going to be about five minutes long, just a quick little response to the movie, and then it ballooned to be about half an hour, uh, which shows I struggle with the idea of brevity. So thank you. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, it's a little bit messy. Don't know if I said everything I wanted to, but have a nice holiday.